Now, the, the next um, and our first keynote speaker is a very good friend of mine. He has um, come to be with us uh, as, a, as a favor for me, but he's been a great thought partner for me for many years. He's been an, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He's run um, very large uh, teams of innovation, helping people transform their businesses in, from McKinsey to Ernst & Young and now at Oliver Wyman. Dennis is one of the smartest people I know, and he also is just great fun and communicates really well. I'd ask you to bring our first keynote speaker to the stage. Please welcome Dennis Layton. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? I, I generally don't have much of a problem being heard. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and I'll walk around a little bit um, and, and talk to you about uh, why I think some of the ideas that Julie was talking about are so increasingly relevant to the work that I do and I think the work that we as, as a community of entrepreneurs do. And, and the key message I really want to, to leave you with today is that where you play is more important than how you play. Right? As entrepreneurs, we know this, right? In, in the conversations I've had with the community of people here just over the past day and a bit, uh, what I would talk to people about is, well, how did you start doing that? And they're like, I, I just happened to be the right place at the right time, and uh, I, I knew how to do it, and so I did. Where you play is more important than how you play. And, and my strong belief that one of the most under-leveraged pieces of data that portfolio managers and portfolio companies are not using is the alignment of their capacity to the granular market opportunity. That's a whole lot to chew on first thing in the morning, I know. So let me, let me say that again, and then I'll tell us a couple stories, and then I'll show you some data from some of my research, and then I'll talk about what I think one of the biggest opportunities out there for unlocking this next wave of productivity and growth could be. Yeah, so uh, let me just say one more time, where you play is more important than how you play. And one of the most under-leveraged pieces of data that portfolio managers and portfolio companies are not using is the granular alignment of that company to the market and the velocity with which they reallocate it. So let me tell you a little bit of a story about me. So I, um, I grew up in a mobile home. Right, uh, started working when I was 13. If I asked uh, my mom for lunch money that day, she wouldn't eat. And so I barely graduated high school with a 1.2 GPA. I think they kicked me out the door because they just could not stand the thought of having me around for another year. Um, really the only thing I could do, right, being in the right place at the right time was join the military, which is what a lot of people from my background do. So I joined the Navy, they gave me a bunch of tests and said, no, you can't be a medic, you're gonna do cryptography or nuclear, pick one of those two things. I had no idea which either of those two things were, and so uh, I said, what's the difference? And he said, if you do nuclear, you won't see the sun for six months of the year because you'll be on a sub, and if you do cryptography, you'll get to visit lots of places. And so I did. Uh, and, and learning uh, the sense of personal efficacy that comes from being in the military changed my life. It taught me that I could kind of do anything, and so I ended up doing a lot of special operations involving the NSA. And because I happened to leave the military at the right time and happened to go to Georgetown at the same time that Bill Clinton was becoming president, and he went to Georgetown, and I had a top secret clearance, and I volunteered for the inaugural committee, one thing led to another, and I ended up with a job at the White House. And then that somehow led to me to being in the right place at the right time, which took me to the London School of Economics, where I studied trade, which got me into McKinsey, which brought me back to Palo Alto, right place, right time, 1996. I helped start their internet practice with a guy named John Hagel, helped write a couple books. There was a client who needed me in Europe. I came back to Europe, right place, right time, was asked to help run a venture fund on the West Coast with the founder of eBay and Netscape and Gateway and a few other frankly, crazy people. Uh, but at that time, May of 2000, which was probably the worst possible timing possible to start a venture fund, um, what we learned was that uh, being in the right place at the right time has a lot of lessons. And so what I did, because I couldn't be a venture capitalist at that time, is I started writing articles for the Harvard Business Review on what's now known as web services, right? How, how dispersed services work together in an automated kind of way to deliver better outcomes, which is a, a theme I'll come back to in a minute. 
That led me to being asked to, to be the worldwide executive for IBM's first major cloud offering, which led me to lead the turnaround of their outsourcing business, which brought me back to McKinsey to work with a bunch of technology companies. <coughs> McKinsey was super hard because my industries kept dying. So I came back as technology guy and then uh, was working with a bunch of technology com uh, telecoms and technologies companies and they would get bought. And then there would be a consulting ban so you could take the cost out. Not a good way to make partner. And so I switched, right? I went from being a telecoms guy to a high tech guy and then my big technology company got bought and there was a consulting ban. So I became a healthcare guy and there was a new election and uh, then there was a consulting ban after the election, right? And then I became a defense guy and then there was a defense freeze. Right? And in each of these things, I had to keep moving. But you know, it's really kind of interesting because in my cohort of 13 pre-partners, I was the only one who made partner. In fact, in 2010, I was one of the only people in the world because they weren't handing a whole lot of partnerships out that year. And, and the lesson I learned from that is, it, I wish it was because I was brilliant. But as you guys get to know me and, and see me after a couple of glasses of wine, you'll realize I'm not, right? I just happen to be in the right place in the right time. And because I think you could argue, I actually wasn't as good as the people who spent all of their time on those industries. I was more uh, easily shed. I didn't go down with the ship as each of those things did. I was able with a higher velocity than other folks to move to other industries, other segments, and to be successful. But what I see as I work with my clients, whether that's presidents of leading consumer packaged goods companies, technology companies, healthcare companies, is that the velocity with which we reallocate our capacity is quite slow. We go down with the ship over and over and over again. So let me... Um, show you some, some data from some of my research uh, uh, that will kind of illustrate this point a little bit, and then I'll talk about some implications. So if we can just go to the, the first piece. Oh, do I have a clicker? I got it, I got it, yeah. So this is the worst possible presentation slide for a speech, I know. But what this does is, you know, uh, being something of an outsider and a geek, when I, um, when I made partner at McKinsey, most people, you know, submit these stacks of documents, and I submitted a haiku. And my haiku said, um, I am services dude, healthcare, high tech, and telecoms too. Things change, I stay busy, yeah? And, <laughs> and so that granular view across industries was always something I was really interested in. But you know, then they expected me to be services dude and like know everything about services across Europe, which I did not. So I launched an interesting piece of research where I said, well, help me understand the services market. So you can't read this, but let me just describe what this says. What this does is it takes a, a subset of uh, services industries and then just plots the performance or the profitability and growth of those industries in each country. Now, the, the thing that's really interesting in this is that if there was a single European market for services, the numbers would be the same horizontally, right? The, the, the average profitability, right, in, in each of the European countries would kind of be the same because the more efficient operators would move into other countries. But there's vast variability, right? As you go from profit margins of, you know, 25% uh, to 4%, the other interesting thing is that you would expect a similar number of gray bubbles, right, which is above 15% uh, um, profitability as you go vertically, meaning that uh, you wouldn't have certain countries with more or less bubbles than the other. But what you see here is that the UK, which has the most advanced services market, has almost none. But several other countries do. The slide says that when you take a granular not that much granular, slightly granular view of the services market in Europe, you realize there isn't one, which partially explains why the most advanced services economy in Europe isn't feeling the love, right? Kind of an interesting slide. There isn't a services market in Europe. In fact, the top three providers in each category 
are not the same in any two countries. The top two providers in any category are not the same in any two countries. There is no services market in Europe. And so what you have to do is you have to play it in a much more granular way. Let me just show you a couple more interesting things, and I'll come back to this theme, that I think really builds on a lot of the points that Julie was making around, it's really about the economics, not about the technologies, and how we make the economics work. McKinsey did this very interesting piece of work 20 years ago. They've just updated it again. But what they did is they looked at the, the growth, uh, four different industries, uh, this slide got massacred in the thing. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's not the way he designed it. Uh, in, in different ways. So if you take hair care, right? Hair care is growing at about 5% a year, 5 6% a year. But it varies dramatically as you look across the countries from 1% in the UK to 15% in Italy, and varies even more dramatically, right, by product line. So they, they began to look at the relationship between this sub-sub-sector granularity by country and growth and footprint, right? And what they found, which was so interesting, is that where you play accounts for almost 99% of your growth. The sectors that you're in is 64% of the growth. The M&A activity to enter the higher growth sectors is another 35. And your market share performance, your ability to outcompete, is about 1%. Where you play is more important than how you play. But the vast majority of consulting and activist investing is around changing your how not your where. So you have to ask yourself why, why that is and what that means. I'll, I'll give one more piece of data, and that is that uh, I was at McKinsey and I was leading their organization practice, which is really their transformation practice, and uh, EY asked me to go and be the global leader of their people advisory services business. It's a $1.8 billion a year business, 16,000 people reporting to me, the majority of which was around mobility. Right? And because I believe that where you play is more important than how you play, I, I liked that. And so I, I showed up and I said, the first thing I want to do is I want to understand, does mobility matter? Does where you put your people matter? Right? Or is it just a big boondoggle? And the way that we did it is um, I, I also helped start McKinsey's diversity practice. And so uh, I would donate a workday a month for diversity candidates. Uh, BAME, women, LGBT, and I've personally trained about 200 of the top executives in those categories. Um, and so one of them happens to run LinkedIn, and so I called him up and I said, hey, Josh, I have this rocking idea. You're going to give me LinkedIn's data, and I'm going to do all this really cool research, and we'll find out whether or not mobility matters. And he said, yeah, no. Um, Microsoft owns us, and we don't give Microsoft our data, so no. But in the end, we ended up doing a joint venture. And what we looked at was, what is the alignment? And this is at the highest, most gross level. This isn't even at a granular level. What is the alignment of where the market is and people are and performance? So as an example, the global market for beer, right? What percent of that global market is in France? Heineken, what percent of your people are in France? That's it, very high level. Does it matter? Well, the reality is across all industries except um, distilled spirits, right? There's a reason you boil water in Scotland and ship it to India, right? Uh, but except for distilled spirits, the, there was a very strong statistically significant relationship between your alignment of your people and your market. In pharmaceuticals, the profit per employee for the companies in the top quartile of that alignment was 400% that of those in the bottom quartile of the alignment. In some categories of consumer packaged goods, it's 700%, right? And so where you play is more important than how you play. And if you have your people that aren't in the markets where that opportunity is, you won't perform as well. It, it's kind of not rocket science when you think about it. But almost every organization 
is misaligned. And countries are, are significantly misaligned. So companies based in the US tend to do a much better job of having their people in the markets where the market is. If the UK-based companies had the same average level of alignment to the market that the US-based companies do, it would be worth a trillion dollars in GDP. And so, as we think about this, I think that as asset managers, as portfolio managers, as uh, executives in, in large organizations, we often use a metric of what is our performance or our company's performance relative to their industry peers. What we do not do, and what we could do, and should do, is ask the question of what is the alignment of our portfolio or our company or our enterprise relative to their footprint peers. People with the same granular footprint in the market. And if that is one or better, you don't have a people problem. I cannot take people who are working in a market that's growing at 2% and get them to grow at 4. No one can, right? But I can get people who are working in a 2% growth market and move a bunch of them into something that's growing at 6 and change your growth rate. But we spend a lot more time thinking about how do we change the people than we spend on how do we change the footprint. To the point that now when I sit down with a senior executive who has, wants to talk about a performance transformation, the first question I ask is, talk to me about your footprint. And do you even have that data? So why am I talking about this in this context? I'm talking about it in this context because I think that there's a massive entrepreneurial opportunity here. Because we have, if we ask ourselves why the velocity of this um, uh, reallocation is so slow, it's really one of four reasons. And, and I think that just talking to the people here over the past couple of days and listening uh, to some of the stalking I've done on you guys before coming, um, you're talking about uh, things that actually touch on this. So, it's a very slow building slide. Um, the first is that Organizations lack a rigorous way of market and taxonomy sensing. What do I mean by that? So when I do strategy work, the first thing that I do is I ask the question of what is the taxonomy of the market at a granular level, and more importantly, how is that changing? So going back to this person who runs a large consumer packaged goods company, she'd say, you know, we didn't realize, we thought the market was flat. We didn't realize that almost 20% was shifting to peer-to-peer -peer transactions via Facebook. So if you don't have a granular view of the market, who's in the market and how that's doing, you won't be able to know how you're not aligned to the market, which is partially why I find the concept of entrepreneur country so exciting. If you have 300,000 organizations across the world who were entrepreneurs, and you had a way to map that to a taxonomy, which would effectively be your operating system, and you owned that taxonomy and that data, you suddenly have a way to map where people need to be, right? The typical m and department in an organization is, is in the tens of people. They can't look at that many deals or have that kind of insight from the, the reports that they're getting right now. But if they had a way to understand where growth was actually happening in a way that they could trust based on a taxonomy that was constantly being updated. When I did my work on web services, the really interesting thing is, you know, th there are directories of web services with terms that people can contract with real time right now. But you can't do that with companies, especially the smaller companies. Which takes me to the second one, which is that it's hard to deal with the volume of speed dating required. Your typical M&A department, even for very large organizations, looks at less than 100 deals a year. But if you're a multi-billion dollar organization, what you need to be doing is getting in and out and testing in these things at, at the level of thousands. But you have no way to do that in part because there's just a lot of bad romance in company to company relations, right? I mean, we're still stuck in the you are my chattel mode, right? In terms of the way that we interact with companies that we work with. I must own you. 
for us to work together. And, you know, there's some movement, but we're moving from you are my chattel to I am your over-controlling boyfriend, right? Where we micromanage people uh, to a point that it takes all of the steam out of their growth. I'm going to ring fence you, but make you follow all of these reporting things that take about 30 or 50 percent of your time. And what we need to do is find a way to move to being friends with benefits. Now, it's actually quite interesting because this is a way that blockchain could really make a difference. If you think about the way that blockchain is working with digital rights management and royalty allocation across the video game industries or other kinds of things, what they've done is they've turned something that was very cumbersome and difficult to use to a, look, here are my contract terms, here's what I have available, here's where it's being used, here's your payment. And then the last thing is that shifting capacity, especially in non-agile environments, especially in Europe, is really, really hard because the contracting mechanism that we're using and the employment uh, uh, paradigms that we're using don't match. And so my challenge to this group over the next couple of days, as we're gonna talk about some very cool technologies, some very disruptive things, right? Lots of innovation, lots of passion, lots of money, is to find the way to not just follow the entrepreneur, but follow the markets that they're working and growing in and find a way to bring those back to these Goliaths in a way that works better than it does today. So I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions. I've got a question. <coughs> I have a quick seat. We'll just take a couple. Uh... Interviewing teacher. <laughs> Thank you. There, yep, uh, cool, excellent. Uh, so I have one question. I hope that there's uh, one or two out there after me. Um, I mean, that, that really helps to explain a lot um, about, you know, why things are happening in, um, you know, uh, financial markets and, and everything. What do you think is going to happen as a result of people, people hear this, um, your impact, um, it, is this going to become a megatrend that people will actually understand organizational velocity, or do you think in five years' time, the markets will still, Europe will still be at the same growth rate, your companies, I mean, is this just part of what happens every time in the 60 to 80 year cycle? You know, you'll make some good money, some of your companies will win, but overall, nothing really changes. Yeah. So I I think that one of the really interesting things in the cycles that you talked about and the economics that you talked about were that, you know, there is a first mover to scale increasing returns network effect in a lot of the platforms that you talked about. Uh, but there isn't a platform today around this taxonomy, mm -hmm. right? There isn't a platform around the taxonomy that allows people to both discover, authenticate, uh, negotiate terms, track shipments, and then receive payments. And, and, and so I think that uh, someone will start building this and start knitting it together. And, and what will probably happen is that you will have an aversion of this in the U.S. that does not understand Europe at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there will probably be different versions of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the people who start uh, by understanding the heterogeneity of, of the European market actually have a better chance of, of having a global footprint on this. Okay. So. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please, Celine. If you could just stand up and uh, say who you are. There's a there's a mic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, what is the fine line to make a decision to say, okay, I'll change? where I'm gonna play. Yeah. How long does that take and how do you define that? Yeah. So, so that's why I talk about those two different ratios. What is your performance relative to your peers and what is your performance relative to your footprint? Right? If you are in a low growth footprint, change your footprint. And you know, the metric that I use, if it's an under 5% growth, you're gonna die. Right? I mean, if you're in an under 5% growth industry, there's got to be massive uh, consolidation because you'll only uh, survive based on economies of scale. Right? And so unless you're going to be that uh, uh, scale-based player, right, I would change your footprint. But I think that it's this constant looking at 
it, right? I, I actually envision a world in which you have a quarterly meeting, uh, you know, having worked in a, a, a you know, a large strategy group for IBM, right? The yearly strategy cycle is kind of an obsolete kind of idea. If instead you're looking at a quarterly basis on what your footprint and your performance relative to those markets are, that'll help inform a whole lot of that. But I, I think that, you know, the idea of th this is so important to me it, based on my change work, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a sociologist from Berkeley, California. Most people would expect me to want you to hug them, right, in a, in a first meeting. You're all safe. It's okay. But uh, the, the, the people angle has been overplayed. The psychology at scale, we can change people. We can motivate people. We can get them to believe that their purpose is my profitability, right? I think that age is over. What we have to do is be much more pragmatic, especially as we, we move to more of a millennial kind of workforce around where is the opportunity in the market and how are we going to get that? So, uh, Christina, please, give, uh, we need to get a microphone over to Christina. Okay, project, yes. Explain to me how you're using it. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll uh, so one of the things I did at McKinsey is I helped start their cybersecurity practice, right? And uh, so I've worked with most of the major providers on the cybersecurity market. And it wasn't until we actually put a taxonomy in place of what are the big, the building blocks of cybersecurity, right? You've got, uh, you've got uh, remote sensing, you've got firewalls, you've got services. You, and when you actually look at that and then double click on each of those things, what you find is the only people who make money in cybersecurity are doing remote monitoring. And they're making that money on remote monitoring not because they have some whiz bang technology, but because they're doing a labor arbitrage to people in India, right? What it does is it allows you to take this big industry, divide it by uh, function, for lack of a better term, or functionality and geography, and then look at what's actually happening to the performance in each of those markets, and you'll find uh, it's sometimes a 10x difference by cell. So it's important to classify? It's important to break the big industry into its smaller pieces because they'll have radically different economics. And back to Julie's point of, you know, you need to follow the economics, not the technology. When we understand where people are actually making money in these markets, then we can actually reallocate our own footprint to where that money is so that we don't find ourselves doing the macho thing, which we love to do, which is I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to outcompete them. I'm going to, you know what I mean? That's how we, we, we compete the margins away. There's a smarter way to do it, which is that let's just go where the growth is. And let's be flexible and nimble enough that we're not trapped there. Malcolm, Malcolm Ross. Uh, good morning. Um, one of the words you used here is mobility, right from your trailer park origins and so on, right through to the end there. I'd just like to suggest of expanding that word because it implies physical mobility. And things I'm seeing with some of the startups I'm working around with the world is people's logical mobility. So, you know, you can fire a drone in Afghanistan from Texas, that sort of thing, you know, working at a distance. There's a very much more subtle thing. I'm, I'm working on a concept for a startup called Second Job. It's a job for a second. You can actually move around your employment by the second. And so the word mobility to me, me means physical, logical, and then uh, skill or, or, or your qualifications. Does that match what you're... It, it does, and it's actually one of the reasons why I, I'm so excited about Entrepreneur Country, because if you have this data set of 300,000 organizations, and what you need to be doing is participating in, at, you know, at a granular level, luxury hair care in, Indi uh, in Italy, right? The ability to uh, contract, right, for a period of time in that space and then get out without you having to set up the organization and the other kinds of things, which is why I think that the contracting model, getting past the bad romance, is going to be so important for this to work. One last question, please. We could listen to Dennis all day. I have it then. Great. If nobody, if nobody has a question, um, you know, you, you, it, it's always fun to listen to you. But when you talk about being in the right place at the right time and so forth, uh, call me skeptical, but you didn't know that at the time. You figured it out later. Right. When did you figure out, when did you have that aha moment when you, when you kind of said, wow, I've kind of been at the right place, I've gotten myself in the right place, I've benefited from being in the right place, or the sun is, you know, the gods have been on my side. When did that come to you? Yeah. So, so I think this is a really important point because you don't know what to do next if you aren't there now. That's probably way cryptic, right? <laughs> so what I mean by that is that 
in my own uh, journey, it, it's only because I had made the move that I could make the next move. And so a lot of organizations who are locked into these 2% growth footprints, they're never going to get to 8% if they don't find a way to get to 4 right? And so uh, you don't have that foresight. What you have is you have the uh, knowledge that only comes from participating at the moment on what's working and not working at the fringe. And so if you haven't pushed yourself to your fringe and you aren't experimenting in that fringe and participating in that fringe, you'll never know. So no one has all the answers, but what they have is, is just the knowledge that comes from being involved, from showing up. Excellent. I think we we could not have had a better opening keynote speaker to wake us up and to give us some, some excellent frameworks for thinking about uh, all of the opportunities in the market. I'm so thankful for you in general, as you know, and in particular for coming and opening up the fall of the entrepreneur and tell me, thank you so much, Dennis. Please thank Dennis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.